Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Our next speaker has been working on games with Nuco Toys, with Saban, and with Electronic Arts, where he was lead designer of an unannounced Star Wars project before we hired him at Ignited Artists. He's also given one of the very best talks I've ever seen at any conference, so I'm very excited to see what he does here today. Please help me in giving a very warm welcome to the stage, Mr. Christopher Ori. Hello, everybody. Uh, I, I'm, I fear for running long, so I'm just going to go ahead and get right into it. Um, my name is Chris Ori, and uh, this is my topic. So uh, yeah, let's start. Uh, I want to give you a brief rundown of my experience uh, and history and what led me to talk about this particular thing here right now. Uh, I entered the games industry at a modest fund. Uh, where I was the director of operations for an accelerator program that put me in direct working relationship with 30 plus companies uh, over the course of three classes. Uh, I spent the last five years in the role of lead designer at Nuco Toys, Saban Brands at Maxis, uh, where I worked on a host of IPs such as Monsterology, Animal Planet, Digimon, and Star Wars. Mostly mobile, all free to play. Uh, and I'm currently a senior designer at Ignited Artists, and a quick plug for our founders, who are uh, Danielle Deibler, who was the de facto CTO at KickSci. Uh, she raised that company from $100,000 a year revenue to $300 million a year revenue, and she also led our founders to secure us some Series A funding back in February, so that's super awesome. I get paid. Um, we have our CCO, Alessandro Tento, who is an Academy, Academy Award winner for Shrek, and he's fresh out of Activision, and he brings an amazing uh, art talent to our company. And the handsome and talented Mr. Scott Foe, sitting over here, a uh, mobile Hall of Fame inducted game designer, uh, an all-around amazing guy. Uh, <coughs> so uh, everywhere you look uh, here at Casual Connect, somebody's going to tout the virtues of free to play. I don't need to go over it. You're here. You know what it is. Uh, but I will put out my top three reasons for believing in free-to-play. And although I've been a core gamer my entire life, for these and many other reasons, I was sold almost immediately on the possibilities of free-to-play games. Uh, but when I went out into the world to talk about my excitement with my coworkers and friends and colleagues, I realized that people were just not seeing the promise that I was. Uh, and I would get a, some variation of two different reactions. Either I would get this, which is contempt, Cond uh, condescension, uh, pity, uh, and this is mostly from game designers, or this, which is just vein popping anger, engineers. Uh, so in organizations I worked with, I saw these reactions almost as often as I did out in the real world. Uh, this year at GDC, I attended a talk from the VP of Game Designer Riot. Uh, it was a totally fascinating topic about how you can take roguelike mechanics and fold them into your games. It was super awesome. And after the talk, I got up and I asked the question, have you thought about how you can apply this to free-to-play mechanics? And an audible groan just swept throughout the room. Uh, and keep in mind, this is a room filled with industry professionals in a talk uh, by the head of design for what is arguably the most successful free-to-play game on the market right now. Uh, and the industry, because it, the industry, it's obvious that the industry is rife with this anti-free-to-play sentiment. Uh, and even in a free-to-play studio where these feelings might come from mi a minority, this minority tends to be very vocal. Uh, they hurt morale, they instigate long, unnecessary, time-wasting, circular arguments, uh, and they aren't contributing with the energy and the passion that they could be. Uh, so here we are. One in seven game gamers will have tablets within the next year. Free-to-play is breaking into hardcore console and PC market. Studios who have always created pay, paid products are now choosing to give this new model a shot. Uh, and because of this, teams are facing a fundamental change from what they see as switching from being a game studio to switching to being a free-to-play studio. Invariably, this, is, this causes internal conflict, which perpetuates preconceptions, a lack of enthusiasm, and there are ethical questions or ideological biases all of which, in the worst cases, lead to outright resistance to progress. So in order to solve this problem, I set out on a quest, uh, taking my own experience and calling on some of 
some friends and industry thought leaders to try and solve the problem. Uh, the first person I spoke with is this handsome gentleman that you uh, just met a few minutes ago, and I'm not going to go over his background because he did that already, and he basically did my entire talk for me, so never mind. Yeah, just kidding. Um, so then there was also Bernard Chen, uh, and oh, also, uh, I'm sorry, Bernard Chen. Um, Bernard Chen, uh, when he said that he was really happy talking to people, he was absolutely not kidding. Uh, he is super great, and he is he will sit down and have any sort of conversations you need, and he's a brilliant guy. So Ben Cousins, uh, exactly the same, in fact. Um, he's currently the CEO at Outsiders, he's the GM at DNA, uh, and he was GM at EA, where he actually was at EA Easy, which was their first foray into free-to-play before free-to-play was even in the West, and they were looking at Korean games as their model. So he was there at the very, very onset of uh, this new wave. Uh, Tanya Samsonoff. Uh, Tanya is currently the director of marketing at Stardock and was a global marketing manager at EA. Uh, Michael McCormick, who it was the GM at Human Nature, creative director at Maxis, uh, and a game designer currently at Telltale. And lastly, Carol Shaw. Carol Shaw has produced like everything. Uh, she is currently the EP at Telltale. She's been an EP at Kixai, NG Moco, uh, and was also a producer at Maxis and EA. So after bringing all these brilliant people together, uh, there were two areas of importance that kind of emerged. Uh, your team composition and how to resolve resistance and how to get these guys who are not sold on the model to put their heart into your product. So we'll start with team, and this is going to be about who to hire, who to keep, and what traits to look for in those people. These are the frenemies. Uh, they're your two creative leaders who will build the next massively successful game for you. Uh, your product manager uh, makes sure that you'll make as much money as possible, and your game designer ensures that the players you buy will open up your game more than once. Uh, having the right talent in these positions is absolutely crucial. So ideally, um, we'll start with product manager, ideally you should find a PM with experience shipping and running live free to, a live free-to-play title. Uh, if you're lucky enough uh, and you have the budget to bring on one of these rock star PMs, you're a step or two in front of the problem. Uh, obviously, not every organization is going to be able to do this, and, or you're not going to be hiring at the right time, so you're not going to be able to find the right person. Um, but I do have a wish list, and you should try and check as many of these boxes as possible. So you need to find a BM with business, develop ex de business development experience. In a free-to-play game, this person is essentially going to be creating your revenue stream, and they're going to have complete control on how your IP is being sold. Uh, a PM that comes from design or art or QA isn't going to have the same mindset as one that's approaching the problem from a BD. They need to be able to get their hands dirty building and modeling feature performance in Excel. Having these models will show how, each feature, how much each feature will make, uh, and your discussions whether a feature is worth the positive or negative impacts on your player exp experience will be informed by numbers. You'll be able to show your team why these features were chosen and how altering them to be kinder will affect your revenue. Numbers are the best way to back up any argument. Uh, this person should be able to take any dynamic in your game and come up with creative solutions on how to monetize on it. It should have good enough, they should have a good enough understanding of game balance to be able to pull back on those crazy ideas that they come up with that won't ruin the play experience. Uh, they need to have more than one tool in their toolbox. Uh, and that's, if you guys have been here for the last like two or three talks, you know this entirely. Uh, there's more to free to play than random packs and gacha. Um, just because a monetization mechanic works in one game doesn't mean that it's right for every game. And the most successful games have monetization features that are woven seamlessly into the core game and metagame loops. Features that feel forced fail every single time. Uh, and research, research, research. Uh, getting the data is the first step. Uh, exploring successful game comps and being able to dissect why those features work and being able to synthesize that information into your product um, keeps you from having to reinvent, reinvent the wheel or fall into some well-worn traps. Uh, the days of fire and forget are over. Uh, free to play will, uh, your free to play game will never be done. Success isn't proven on day one, uh, but it might come after many phases of post launch iteration and improvement. Uh, your PM needs to know how to read the data, find the problems, and make the right changes. 
This came up over and over and over again from everyone I spoke with. Your PM cannot be the enemy or some guy in a lofty tower. They need to be in the trenches with the team, generating their trust and respect. If your PM is seen as an antagonist, uh, it will further reinforce the team's negativity against the model. Uh, okay, let's talk about designers. Uh, there are two roles here. There's your, gonna be your lead designer, uh, who is the peer to your PM, and then there's the design pool, who will document the feature list and, that the PM and the lead designer create. Uh, this person is the team your is this is the person that your team should be able to rally around. They should get the team excited about the product and believe in its merits. Every day they should be talking about how amazing the product is and how good the model is. They should be able to veto features that they feel ruin the play experience. At the same time, they must be able to work with the PM and fold monetization features seamlessly into the game and build mechanics that support your PM's initiatives. Listen to your designers. I can't stress this enough. The right person in this position will be thinking about both game, or all, all of the above, gameplay, monetization, retention, and how it all fits together and be creating those features accordingly. Uh, do not devalue the power of retention and how far creating a great game experience goes towards converting your players. So often games don't get out the door or fail once they hit the market because production ignores the advice of design and the resulting product ends up proving to be unfun. Uh, onto the design, the design pool. Design, designing balance out of the game is uncomfortable for a designer, and it's antithetical to their training uh, and their experience. They're, these people can be really hard to convince. Their design pool doesn't need to be avid free-to-play converts, uh, but they do need to. They need to not be an impediment to your progress. Helping them understand who their audience is and who they're making the game for, and that it's not necessarily themselves, really, really goes a long way here. Did I skip one? No, I didn't skip one. Uh, also, analytical designers will tend to enjoy the job they're given because there's a lot of economy balancing involved in free-to-play. Traditional level designers or designers that enjoy building melee combat and character sat systems are probably not gonna be the right fit in this position. Uh, and engineers. These people don't need, necessarily need special skills to succeed in a free-to-play environment. They do need to have the right mindset and the right motivators to stay engaged and excited about the product, because engaged, excited, gets them working harder, um, gets them to be superheroes. And you can't make a game without them. Uh, you want to promote developers that have an interest in working on features that benefit players. Uh, you can use player feedback and metrics to motivate them to get them excited about implementing things. When choosing your engineers, ask this question. If this game is successful, would you want to work on it forever? What you're looking for is enthusiasm. You're looking for an expressed desire or a regret that they had for not being able to improve a game after it had launched. And you're not looking for someone who wants to bang out this project and move on to the next big thing. So your team, uh, let's talk, uh, talk about getting that important buy-in. Uh, both anti-free-to-play and pro-paid game sentiment are ideological viewpoints. Ideologies are really hard to work with, and they don't change overnight. It might take weeks and weeks of conversations and convincing to break through their thought walls. It's important to keep in mind that game developers are core gamers. Uh, sometimes uh, executives tend to forget this, uh, I found. Uh, your, your, your developers are steeped in game media. Uh, which, is overwhelming, which overwhelmingly pushes the idea that free-to-play is evil, everybody hates it, uh, and it's ruining the game industry. Uh, they talk about, they, your developers are gonna talk to, about games on Reddit, where the loudest, trolliest members of the vocal minority live, uh, and they're proud of the fact that their friends back home in Chicago see them as king gamer living the dream. Uh, ideological responses come from an emotional place. They're rarely thought out, and they're hardly ever logical. Free-to-play makes people twitchy because in all free-to-play, no matter what it is, uh, how kind it is, still, if you pay, you gain some advantage over people that do not pay. Designing out balance goes against everything gamers think to be fun and fair. In the past, uh, developers made the game and handed their product over to marketing. Evil marketing had their way with the de developer's pure expression of love, and there's no new tale to tell after that. Uh, in this scenario, other people are the bean counters. Uh, in free-to-play, the developers are involved at every stage of the funnel. 
Now, in a sense, this can be a good thing because it allows developers control over this highly important part of your game's life cycle. But it's hard for people who see themselves as artists to come to terms with this. Uh, let's talk about some of the common things that you'll hear and how you can address them specifically. Uh, if you make a good game, it will sell. Paid products work. Uh, and in a sense, these people aren't wrong. I've, I've heard this over and over again a lot. This is one of the hardest arguments. It's because their entire career has been supported and reaffirmed by this exact conception that selling a game makes money. The problem is that the market is changing and paid companies have a harder time turning a reasonable profit. Customers complain that price is too high uh, for what they get, they wait for the price to drop, or they just buy all their games on Steam summer sale. Um, Civilization Beyond Earth, uh, which was released yet last year, is a full AAA game uh, from a well-known brand that dropped in the market 10 to $20 less than other titles usually do. Now, this shows that they have an awareness on, the part, um, uh, on their part uh, of the change in customer sensitivity towards price. Paid success stories on mobile are not the norm at all. Uh, one title I heard a lot of paid advocates from, uh, heard about a lot from paid advocates the most is XCOM. XCOM is comparable to almost nothing. Uh, its IP and nostalgia factor are absolutely through the roof. Uh, this doesn't change the fact that it's an amazing game, but the same game with a different IP would not have done so well. Uh, Monument Valley is a game that could not possibly have had a more blessed history. It won multiple awards. Everyone wrote about this game and how good it was. It's been repeatedly featured in the App Store. And to date, after a year and a half in the market, it's only made a little over $6 million. And that's after $1.5 million in, rev in, in development cost. Compare this to Crossy Road, which released a couple months later and pulled in $10 million in its first 90 days. Uh, granted, this isn't as innovative of a game, but it's comparable in reception and coverage. App Annie is your strongest tool for addressing these arguments. Your PM should know the recent numbers, have this knowledge on hand, and be able to respond to it accordingly. And just to note, just because they're all up here behind me, um, uh, App Annie didn't pay me for all this plug I'm giving them. They just happen to be a really incredible argument settler. Uh, League of Legends, Hearthstone, or some other darling game is free-to-play done right. Uh, this is unfortunately not true. Uh, they're more like free-to-play done. Um, they're, there's, they're no doubt successful free-to-play games, but monetization mechanics are specifically designed for each game uh, and their free-to-play strategies. Uh, the free-to-play strategies in both of these games rely on huge player base and these companies already, th that these companies already had on hand, uh, which they were able to mobilize right upon release. Uh, League of Legends from Dota, Hearthstone from WoW. Most companies are not gonna have the luxury of this resource um, when they launch. Free to play is taking over slash destroying the game industry. The truth here is that TV didn't kill film, console didn't kill TV, mobile free to play is not gonna go back in time and kill your firstborn kitten. Uh, there's enough entertainment dollars for everyone. People who say this feel like that if they do a good job, they're betraying the industry and contributing to the downfall of something that they love. They're going to be some of your toughest holdouts because their viewpoint is constantly being reinforced by gaming media and their friends. The best way to address this is to direct them to articles that affirm console and AAA aren't going away and to reinforce that free-to-play, casual, mobile audience is growing because it's tapping a new demographic than the one console has. Hardcore gamers that play free-to-play games don't stop playing their console. They simply play their mobile devices while they're waiting in line for coffee or going to bed. Uh, Free-to-play and mobile teams are the B teams. This statement implies that the people who make free-to-play games, uh, I'm sorry, the statement implies that they see people who make free-to-play games as someone other than who they think themselves to be. Uh, people who make free-to-play games aren't real gamers. Uh, they're business people, not creatives. Like I mentioned before, your team are core gamers. They grew up playing Atari, Infocom, Nintendo, Sega. Uh, they were raised on hardcore and cottage games. Mobile and free-to-play gaming is less than 10 years old in the US. It hasn't had time to build a cultural nostalgia. And no uh, prestige is had from working on these titles yet. Uh, game designers have almost 40 years of knowledge base to work with. Everything to be solved has been solved. And there are very little new discoveries to make. Free-to-play is an absolutely brand new field. Use this to your advantage. Discovery is exciting. Solving problems is exciting. No one can feel like they're on a B team when they're faced with a complex problem and trusted to create an innovative solution for it. 
Uh, Free-to-play games aren't good games. This is a fallacy born from personal experience. I buy all the DLC for the games I, I own is not an acceptable answer to what free-to-play games do you play. Uh, challenge these people to go out and play all the free-to-play games that they can and find the ones that they like. They don't need to spend money on it, they just need to enjoy the games. Getting them exposed to games will prove their ass uh, this assertion false. Uh, all free-to-play studios care about is making money. The simple fact is that all studios care about, all studios care about making money. Uh, and a paid game studio it has a pretty poor track record of living up to their own hype. Uh, disregarding this is a kind of selective blindness. Every year, the next hot shit game comes out. Uh, it's toted out on 100-foot high billboards after releasing a souped-up fake gameplay trailer and endorsed by your favorite celebrity. And you pay $60, and you get a home, and it's shit. And every year, games get shorter, and, or they're just some PvP platform with no metagame, only a shell of a story, and the most shallow form of progression. Uh, this is a reason why pre-orders are such a big business in AAA. This is the worst paywall that I can possibly imagine. In the end, the statement is saying, I don't trust you to care about the product more than your bottom line. At Maxis, we address this problem of trust with a tool we call the three rules. Now, this was come up, uh, we came up with these rules um, across the board, everyone from executives um, at every level contributed to these five rules. Uh, we were set, <coughs> we use, uh, using these set of rules is useful to, to declare to your team, we're not going to be evil, or at least we're not going to be as evil as we could be. So coming up with the rules will be different for every organization uh, and every product at Maxis. These were the rules. Number one, no timers. Number two, everything that affects gameplay can be earned through soft currency, and we don't have pay to win. Uh, every purchase should feel valuable. Never push players out of the game. And the game is fun even if you choose not to convert. Again, this is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Devise your own set of rules that are right for you. They don't have to be five. They could be three. And they have to be right for your game, and also right for the feedback you're getting from your team. What do they feel uncomfortable about, and how can you address that? So to recap, here are some final thoughts and takeaways. Change how you frame the discussion and have the facts. Put, a po put the positive advantages of games, in a and games as a service front and center, and make sure that you know the numbers on all pay uh, current paid and free-to-play titles. Uh, don't have monetization, don't have open monetization brainstorms. This is where the sausage is made. If you're having buy-in problems, the worst thing you can do is expose your team to this contentiousness. Use, uh, these are leadership decisions. Your lead designer and your PM need the freedom, freedom to spitball crazy ideas without the temperature rising in the room. Also, if your PM and your lead designer disagree on a direction in that room, once they come out of there, they should have a united front whenever facing the team. There should never look like there is conflict between those two houses. Be passionate about free to play. If you're excited about it, it will be infectious. But excitement isn't as powerful as w without knowledge and direction to back it up. Immerse yourself in free to play and your team will follow. Find their buttons. Put the right people on the right tasks. Even if they don't like the project as a whole, if they like what they're doing, they'll be happy. Create uh, your list of rules and that shows your philosophy and your dedication to, quality product, to a quality product, product that matches theirs. Always go back to these rules as a navigation point. Uh, require exposure to free-to-play. No excuses. Your, teams mu your team must play the games. There are free-to-play games out there for every taste. Even if someone has a favorite, encourage them to, to keep looking and try everything that comes out. It will, keep, it will help them to articulate what they like as well as what they don't like. Both of these things are equally important. Lastly, and most importantly, there are no, there's no such thing as bad free-to-play. Uh, there are only good games and bad games, and it's up to us, it's our responsibility, everybody here in this room, not to poison the well with shitty games and everyone will flourish. So I want to thank uh, my contributors and my founders, all of these, what do I have here, eight people are amazing. So thank you. That's it.